Thanks. There is a saying in uh, homotopy type theory, save Mike Schulman for last. And so that's what we did. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm giving you Mike Schulman, the type theoretic model topics. Thanks, Chris. Um, all right, so, uh, so this, is, this talk is about uh, this thing that, uh, that I call a type theoretic model topos. And uh, this is, my, my goal for this talk is uh, to be um, uh, at a very high level. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna really go into the details of any, very many, any proofs um, or, uh, and I might skip over the details even of some definitions, but uh, my, my overall goal really is to try to convince you that this notion, this thing called, that I call a type theoretic model topos, um, is a good level of abstraction. Uh, and uh, so let me start by, by saying what it's an abstraction for. So uh, it's, this is, we're in the world of, of semantics of homotopy type theory. Uh, so on the one hand, we have type theory, which is nice and syntactic and convenient and implementable. And uh, it, has the, it, has, it has strict definitional equalities for various properties. Um, and on the other hand, we'd like to interpret this type theory into a semantic world of infinity categories or of some kind, um, which are semantically interesting to mathematicians uh, and everything is defined up to equivalence. And so in order to make that bridge, we need some kind of coherence theorem, uh, which, and generally the way that we do this is we have some kind of a strict structure that models type theory and which also suffices to be a presentation of these weak uh, infinity categories. And this is where the, the type theoretic model toposes fit in. Um, the goal for this, this notion is that they have all the structure necessary to model um, homotopy type theory with universes, with univalence axiom and higher inductive types and sort of all this stuff that we would like. Um, but on the other hand, they're also general enough that they present all the desired infinity categorical models. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of a goal, uh, but uh, I think that uh, a large fraction, large amounts of that goal are, are achieved uh, with the definition that I'm, as I'm gonna present it uh, today. Uh, and the, although there's some room for, for further tweaking and further progress as well um, in the future. So without further ado, let me start with the definition. So here's the definition. Uh, a type theoretic model topos is a right proper Sosinski model category with fiber-wise enrichment and structured vibrations. Uh, so obviously I'm not expecting you to know what all of these words mean. Uh, some of them I haven't even defined precisely. Um, so let's, uh, let's zoom in one at a time on each of these pieces. So first let's start uh, uh, at the very uh, end here on, on what it means to be uh, a model category. Uh, we had a brief review of model categories at the beginning of the week. Um, so this is gonna be a similar sort of brief review. Uh, a uh, the model category um, comes from abstract homotopy theory. It was defined by, by Quillen in the uh, mid 20th century uh, with the goal of presenting, well, I don't know if this was Quillen's goal, but nowadays we view a model category as a presentation of an infinity category. Uh, so it's a, it's a complete and co-complete category um, with three classes of maps called co-fibrations, vibrations, and weak equivalences. And uh, as usual, I'm gonna write these uh, classes of maps uh, in this way, the co-fibrations have a tail, the fibrations have a double point, uh, and the uh, weak equivalences uh, have a twiddle on them. Uh, and when we, when we put two of them together, we have a co-fibrations that is also a weak equivalence. We call it an acyclic co-fibration. And uh, similarly, we have acyclic fibrations. They're also sometimes called trivial vibrations or trivial co-fibrations. So the axioms on these three classes of maps are that the weak equivalences satisfy the two out of three property, that if I have two composable maps, F and G, and uh, two out of the F and G and the composite are weak equivalences, so is the third one. And then these, these two pairs, the cofibrations and the acyclic vibrations, or the acyclic cofibrations and the vibrations are weak factorization systems. So that means that uh, every map factors into one of these and then the other one, and then there's some lifting property that uh, um, is not really going to matter very much for us right, uh, today. So the idea, if you're if you're coming from model the idea of modeling type theory, the point is to use the vibrations to represent uh, dependent types. So we think of the objects of this category as representing contexts. Um, the vibrations over a base type are regarded as representing con types in that context. Uh, the terms belonging to such a type uh, are represented by the sections of that vibration. Uh, and then when I take a vibration and I pull it back along some morphism of contexts, that corresponds to substitution of such a morphism of contexts into a type. 
And you have to do some that fancy coherence theorem in order to sort of strictify the pro pullback in order to actually um, interpret type theory in this way. But um, those that sort of thing is, is fairly well understood by now due to the work of a lot of people. Um, so I'm not going to really go into the details of that today. So that's um, the general context. We have a model category. Uh, and now we're going to add extra stuff to our model category to allow us to interpret all of the type forming operations that we want um, for homotopy type theory. So the first axiom we add in our model category is that it's what it's called a Sosinski model category um, after um, Sosinski who studied these uh, extensively. Um, so what a Sosinski model category is a model category where the underlying category is a Grotendieck topos. So this is just the ordinary one categorical notion of topos. Um, it usually it's a pre-sheaf topos, um, although it's not technically necessary. Um, and then we have two further axioms. One of the most important one probably is that the co-fibrations are exactly the monomorphisms. So, so this, this notation here of an arrow with a tail is sometimes used to represent a monomorphism, sometimes a co-fibration. In the case of a Sosinski model category, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the same thing. And then we also require that the weak factorization systems are covibrantly generated. That's not going to matter for us to play today, but it's technically useful. Uh, and one of the nice things about a Sosinski model category is comes from the combination of this one topos pro axiom and this, this monomorphism property because monomorphisms in a topos have lots of nice properties. Um, they have unions, for instance, any two subobjects have a union. Um, they are what I call extensive and adhesive and exhaustive. Uh, so uh, this has is some sort of descent property like uh, various sorts uh, that like if you have some push out of a more monomorphism, that's also monomorphism. And if you have some other push out square living over it where some of the maps are pullbacks then some of these other maps are also pullbacks or something like that. Um, and mon monomorphisms are also stable under pullback in any category. Um, so cofibrations in a Sosinski model category have all three of these properties as well, which turns out to be really useful. Um, so that's uh, a Sosinski model category. Um, and then the last general model categorical thing on the top row here is that it's a, what's called right proper. Uh, and uh, I'm going to define this uh, in an equivalent but slightly non-standard way by first defining uh, uh, what's called a sharp morphism. Uh, so this definition I believe is originally due to Charles Resk and he called them sharp, uh, but various other people have studied them later under lots of different names. Uh, so a morphism in a model category is called sharp um, if when I pull back along that morphism it preserves weak equivalences. So I'm going to draw my sharp morphisms like this uh, with a, a uh, a triangle on the end. So what that says is if I have a sharp morphism F, uh, sorry, if I have a sharp morphism F uh, and then I have a weak equivalence that I can pull back along it, then the pullback of that weak equivalence is again a weak equivalence. Uh, and as a consequence of this uh, uh, definition, it follows that if I have two sharp maps down here with the same codomain, and a weak equivalence between them making a commutative triangle, and I pull the whole thing back along some other morphism, then the pullback of that weak equivalence is also a weak equivalence. So this is a different statement, but uh, it's, it follows from the definition of being sharp. So the definition of a right proper model category, uh, it can equivalently be stated by saying that all vibrations are sharp maps. In other words, pull back along vibrations preserves weak equivalences. Uh, this is, um, the converse is not true, even in a, in, a, in a right proper model category, there are sharp maps that are not vibrations, and we'll see some examples later on that will be important. But right properness already um, has this important property uh, in consequence that um, if I push forward a vibration <coughs> along another vibration, I get a, a vibration. So by push forward here, I mean the, the right adjoint to pull back. So uh, if I, I pull back along some map, then it has a right adjoint. Uh, like you might write it as pi sub f or f lower, lower star, and that's this is called push forward. And so here's a diagram of this over here. I have a vibration here, and then I have a vibration, another vibration, and I push it forward and I get a vibration over A, and this is again a vibration. This is what the theorem says. And this is proved fairly easily by sort of an adjoint argument. So um, pullback along this vibration here preserves the equivalences. It also preserves cofibrations because those are monomorphisms, so it preserves acyclic cofibrations. So that means that the right adjoint to that preserves the, the right class of that weak factorization system. And uh, so this, this, this is how we interpret the, the pi types. So this is why right proper Sosinski model category is important because it allows us to interpret pi types by these, this push forward property. 
sigma types, we can, we can interpret in any uh, model category because we can compose two vibrations to interpret the sigma type. So, so that's the first row here, a uh, right proper Sosinski model category. And uh, uh, in terms of semantics, uh, model categories in general uh, present infinity categories, infinity one categories um, that are at least co-complete and co-complete. Usually they're locally presentable. Um, right proper Sosinski model categories present locally Cartesian closed, uh, locally presentable infinity one categories. Uh, in, in the sense that every infinity one category of that sort can be presented by some right proper Sosinski model category and every right proper Sosinski model category presents some infinity one category of that kind. Um, so the fact that we can interpret sigma types and pi types and as I'll mention later also identity types in one of these things tells us that homotopy uh, type theory can be interpreted in all of these infinity one categories. So the goal with these, these things that on the lower level here is to interpret the additional structure beyond that that we have in homotopy type theory. So we have universes with the univalence axiom. We have some higher inductive types. So the first of these is what I'm calling here fiber-wise enrichment. And this is one of the more sort of fungible aspects of the definition. But let me just give sort of the simplest one that's most familiar to a homotopy theorist, which is that it's a simplicial, first of all, it's a simplicial model category. Uh, so that means that the category E is enriched over simplicial sets. Um, if you don't know what a simplicial set is, don't worry about it. Um, there's some nice model category that have been studied for a long time. They present infinity groupoids. Uh, and this enrichment has powers and co-powers. So that means we have this, this thing here, um, this sort of uh, two variable adjunction. Uh, so we have, uh, this, is, this is the simplicial mapping space over here, the enrichment. And if I have simplicial set, simpl simplicial set and I map into it, that's equivalent to mapping out of the co-power or mapping into the power. Uh, so X and Y belong to E uh, here and uh, uh, K is a simplicial set. And in particular importance here are when I have this, is when I take the, the powers and the co-powers by the simplicial interval, delta one, uh, which is uh, just sort of just two vertices and then one simplex between them. Uh, and if I take the co-power by that, that gives me what's called a cylinder. So it's, it looks like X uh, together with, uh, uh, that's stretched out into a cylinder. And then if I take the power by that, I get a co-cylinder uh, or a path object, sometimes it's called. So this is sort of the, who the points of this space are the paths in the object Y. So we're going to require that our type theoretic model topos is a simplicial model category. And furthermore, um, we're going to require that it's fiber-wise simplicial. So whenever I have a simplicial model category, the slice categories are automatically also simplicial model categories. Uh, and, but the extra axiom we require is that the pullback, right? So here, if I have a map here, uh, F from X to Y in E, I didn't write that before. Then I pull back along that map. It gives me a functor between slice categories. And I require that that functor preserves these co-powers. So in, this functor is always going to preserve the powers, it turns out. Uh, and uh, it's a simplicially enriched functor. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily always preserve the co-powers or the cylinders. So we require it to preserve those as well. And that's equivalent to saying that the adjunction uh, between this guy and its right adjoint is a simplicially enriched adjunction. So that's another way of thinking about that. So in other words, that this simplicial enrichment interacts well with the, the pi types, the dependent products that we get from the right proper Sosinski structure. So that's the enrichment there. Um, that's, that's still a fairly familiar thing from model category theory. The fiber wiseness is, is maybe not as quite as familiar, but it's still a fairly straightforward thing. The last bit here um, is what's going to give us the universe. And this is sort of the newest aspect. Uh, it's some notion of structured vibration. So here's the definition. Uh, the definition that the phrase here is, is this terrible mouthful, locally representable and relatively acyclic notion of vibration structure. And the reason this is such a terrible term, term uh, is that it's made put together a bunch of pieces. And so it turns out to be useful when you're constructing these things to break it down into little bits to say, first I have a notion of vibration structure and now I'll prove that it's locally representable and now I'll prove that it's relatively acyclic. But if you sort of take the whole thing as a unit, then here's the definition, which is not too complicated. Um, so first of all, uh, for every morphism in our category E, E x to y, and I'm drawing it down v 
because I'm thinking of it as something kind of like a fibration or a bundle, um, I assign to that some other morphism with the same codomain. And I'm writing that as, as bold F sub X. And this assignment is supposed to vary pseudo-functorially in pullback along something into the base. So in other words, if I have X living over Y and I pull it back to an X prime living over at Y prime, then uh, that pulling back this F of X is not co coherently isomorphic to uh, F of the X prime. So that's what I mean by varying pseudo-functorially. Uh, and then this F has the following property that this X, this map from X to Y is a fibration if and only if this F map has a section. So giving a section of this map is the same as saying that this map is a fibration. And when that has a, a section, then it's automatically an acyclic fibration. That's what this relatively acyclic means. So every acyclic fibration, at least in a Sosinski model category, every relatively, every, every acyclic fibration has a section, but of course not every map with a section is an acyclic fibration. So, so that's the, the saying that these three are equivalent is, it has some content there. Um, but in general, sort of being a fibration is a property, but specifying a section is structure. And so now this gives us a way to talk about what we mean by saying that a, 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 a fibration structure on a map, it's just a section of this F map. Um, to, and so a given fibration might have more than one structure, uh, more than one fibration structure. This map might have more than one section. But as soon as there's any section, then at least it is a fibration. So that's the definition. Um, it's uh, uh, basically complete. Uh, I guess I didn't state the, I didn't say explicitly the, the fibration, co-fibration condition that makes a simplicial model category, uh, a simplicial model category, not just a simplicially enriched, um, but that won't really be important for us. Are there any questions maybe at this point? Okay. I have a quick yes. question. Please. Um, in the fiberwise enrichment, you mm -hmm. said the simplicial enrichment interacts well with pullbacks. Is that kind of like a function extensionality? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you could maybe think of it as some kind of a strict function extensionality. Uh, I haven't really thought about that. Uh, but you don't, you don't need this to prove the function extensionality axiom. That holds in any right proper Sosinski model category. Other questions? Uh, I have a question about yeah. uh, your last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, the, the previous one, well, yes, this uh, as the morphism on the, on the right. Uh, no, 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 uh, the last that you talked about. I mean, this uh, one? About, yes, just, so just, this as a, as a morphism on the right, the other uh, part of the structure or other property? Um, the, these Fs? Uh, no, the isomorphisms on the right. The These isomorphisms. Oh, oh, yeah. This, this is this is structure because it, it has to be coherent, right? So it, it is a pseudo functor. Um, th there's an equivalent way of saying it, with, which is which is the one that's written in, in my paper. If you if you start from what it means for to, a fibration to have a structure, um, and you give sort of an axioms on, on uh, structure on this and operations, then you can characterize these Fs as representing objects for that notion and then their, the, their existence is a property. That's what the locally representable means. But I've, here I've just sort of turned it around and said I'm going to start with the Fs and give them the pseudo functorial structure and then I can define what it means to be a fibration structure in terms of being a section of that. So it's kind of like, like fibrations versus pseudo functors. You can represent it either way. Other questions? There's a question in the chat, how to think of F, and I don't know if you were planning this, on saying something more this, about this, that. Or? This bold F here, how to think of that. Um, I mean, I, I'll, when I come back to talk about examples, I'll talk, say a little about um, what, what kind of a, what a fibration structure means. Uh, but I mean, if, you, if, you, if you think about, if you're used to thinking about like cubicle type theory, you can think of a fibration structure as like a filling operation. And then this F you should think of as the object of fibration structures. It's sort of the classifying object for fibration structures because a section of it is precisely a fibration structure. So you can go in that direction. Seems like the answer satisfies the uh, person asking the question. So great. Uh, oh, just one more. 
Oh, okay. Uh, the oh. will be okay, joint answer. Okay, I uh, will move on then. So, uh, so with that with that definition, now I want to try to help motivate that definition by explaining how it models type theory. So I already mentioned briefly how we get the sigma types and the pi types. Uh, the, the, somehow the, the most difficult thing or the thing that sort of re resisted a general treatment for, 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 for the longest is the construction of a univalent universe in, in model categories that present these higher these infinity one toposets. So let me kind of sketch briefly how that goes. Um, so the theorem is that uh, if I pick an inaccessible cardinal, which is big enough, kappa, then uh, any type theoretic model topos has a universe, which is a vibrant object, so it represents a type, and it's univalent, it satisfies the univalence axiom, um, which classifies the vibrations whose fibers are small with respect to this inaccessible kappa, and this universe is closed under sigma types and pi types and identity types, at least. So, um, so how do we, first of all, how do we get a universe? Um, for simplicity, let's suppose we're in a pre that, that our, our, our model category is a pre sheaf topos. Like I said, uh, it works more generally, but this is the simplest case. Um, now, there's a, there's a general way of getting a universe in a pre sheaf topos, uh, which goes back to, um, I think, Hoffman and Stryker and Vavatsky had a version too, um, which is uh, basically you sort of use the representable objects. So, uh, what this, this universe is supposed to have the property that uh, uh, maps into it from some object classify vibrations or sort of maps over that object. Uh, and so if I map into it out of a representable, uh, that's the same as, by the Yoneda lemma, a maps out of a representable is the same as the value of that pre-sheaf, which I'm calling V, on that object C. But that's also supposed to characterize uh, the, the vibrations or the maps into that representable. So I can basically just define my pre-sheaf by saying V of C is gonna be the set of small, of kappa small maps, kappa small fibers maps, whose codomain is that corresponding representable functor. And then I do this, the ones with a section to get the map, the universal map over it. And so here I'm not using vibrations yet. I'm just talking about all the maps with small fibers. Uh, in a minute, we'll sort of tweak it to get a classifying object for vibrations. Uh, and you have to do some kind of a trick to make this actually a set and strictly functorial that I don't want to get into. Um, but this is because this is the basic idea that you just sort of take define it to classify the correct things over um, for representables. And now we have to tweak that in order to classify vibrations and the, the, the vibration structure is exactly what allows us to do this. So the idea here we define U, so this U is going to be our universe of vibrations we define it to be the classifying object for vibration structures on this universal map like this. And so this is our universal map V tilde, v tilde over V, which classifies all maps with kappa small fibers. And now U is sort of the classifying object for vibration structures on that map, or in other words, it class of maps into it classify structured vibrations um, over something or other. And then U tilde, U tilde is just the pullback of V tilde um, to that U. So let me, let me say a little bit about why this classifies what we hope that it does. Um, so, so first of all, we need to show that this U tilde mapping to U is itself uh, a vibration, okay? So what is it? It's, it's the pullback uh, of this universal map, V tilde mapping to V, which is not a vibration. Okay. Uh, and now in order to show that this thing is a vibration, it's enough to give a section of its F. All right, I'd like to have a section of its F here to make it a vibration. Uh, now pseudo-functoriality tells me that this F U tilde, right, U tilde is the pullback of V tilde. F of U tilde is the pullback of F of V tilde. Okay. Uh, but F of V tilde was how I defined U. U is the classifying map for this guy, right? So that means that when I take this pullback here, F U tilde, another word name for that is it's U pulled back over itself with V. And so there is a map from U to that pullback, it's just the diagonal map here. Okay, so in other words, uh, U is sort of the classifying object for structured vibrations. And so that means there's a canonical vibration structure 
on this universal map over it. So this is a fibration. And then we'd also like to show that if I have any uh, fibration with small fibers, that it is a pullback uh, of this universal thing. And that works similarly. Because this is a fibration, I can choose a fibration structure on it. In other words, a section of my Fx. Because it has kappa small fibers, uh, it's a pullback of this universal map V, tilde to V. Uh, but now uh, F V tilde, right? By, by pseudo-functoriality, this F V tilde pulls back to F X. And so this composite here gives me a map to F V tilde, which is precisely U by definition. Right? And so because this is at this, I choose a structured fibration on this. And so it's therefore classified by a map into the object of fibration structures, the, the classifying object for structured fibrations. And then you can check that this map does in fact classify it. That if I pull back V tilde to U to get U tilde, and then I pull it back again, that's just pasting pullback squares. <coughs> So this, this notion of structured fibration that has this representing object F is kind of precisely what we need in order to construct a universe that classifies fibrations or, or structured fibrations. Uh, and sort of this introduction of structure was the insight of uh, uh, critical type theory, one might say. Uh, and it sort of also works in this sort of more homotopical, classical homotopical perspective to give us a way to, to build these univalent universes. But I said, so I said, yes, question? Sorry, if you equip the same fibration with two different choices of fibration structure, will that result in a different classifying map? Yes, exactly. Um, so I, I said a pullback, but I didn't say unique pullback. So a, a given fibration will be classified by more than one map. And that leads directly into univalence because univalence tells us that it should be classified by a unique map up to homotopy. Uh, and so that's what, when we prove that it's univalent, then we'll be able to tell, say, that any two fibration structures are homotopic in some sense, any two classifying maps are homotopic. So univalence, once we have this classifying object for fibration structures, then univalence actually follows fairly easily uh, based on uh, essentially what Vavadsky did in constructing the simplicial model uh, 10 years ago or more. Uh, so the basic ingredient is what has kind of come to be called the equivalence extension property. Uh, so here it is written out in words, uh, but basically it says if I have all this black stuff over here, I have a fibration E2 over B and it's pullback here, which I didn't draw here, um, its pullback is equivalent to some other fibration over A, and I'm pulling back along a monomorphism, a cofibration, then I can extend my D1, my other fibration, I can extend that to another fibration over B, uh, which is equivalent to E2 and pulls back to D1. Uh, and I don't want to say anything more about the proof that it's basically just like in the Kapok and Lumsden and paper. You look at their proof for simplicial sets and you write it out in the generality of a right proper Sosinski model category and it's essentially just the same proof. Um, and once you've got that, then again, Vavadsky's proof of univalence of the universe essentially works exactly the same. Uh, so you build the classifier of uh, fibrations with an equivalence between them. Uh, and then uh, this equivalence extension property basically says that the second projection from this guy to the universe uh, is an acyclic vibration. In other words, it has the right lifting property with respect to cofibrations, right? Because what does is, what is a square like this mean? This means that uh, this is my E2, my vibration over B. This up here is two fibrations over A and an equivalence between them. So that's my D1 and my D2. And then saying that the square commutes uh, is saying that roughly the speaking that the pullback of E2 to D1, D2, pullback of E2 is D2. There's some strictness involved about actually having exactly the same classifying map, but that sort of uh, works out because of this acyclic vibration assumption on the Fs. I don't want to get into the details of there. But then having a lift here is essentially what, what comes from saying that we have this E1 that is the extension. So this thing is an acyclic vibration and then you use the two out of three property a few times. So, so this, uh, right, this mapping down to you, this composite is the identity. Um, so this is an equivalence. This is of course an equivalence. So this map which assigns to every type its identity equivalence uh, is a weak equivalence. Uh, and then that implies that the map from the path object of U to the equivalence is an equivalence. So that's the univalence of the universe. 
So that's really something that's been known for, for a decade or so, and it all works in this generality. Um, we also want the universe to be a fibrant object so that it actually represents a type. Uh, and uh, this is uh, also fairly straightforward once we have the equivalence extension property. The idea is we, we have some an analogous thing called the fibration extension property, which sort of takes this property of the universe being fibrant and translates it into some statement about fibrations. In this case, it says that if I have an acyclic cofibration here and uh, I have a fibration over its domain, then I can extend it to a fibration over the codomain, which pulls back to the one that I started from. Uh, and uh, we can prove this basically using the equivalence extension property and the fibration fact properties of the model category. So here's my, um, I've got this written out in steps and colors over here. I have a fibration over A, I take the composite uh, X going to A and then going to B. And this is, so step two here in green is I factor it I factor this composite as an acyclic cofibration followed by a fibration. Uh, and then uh, I take this fibration Q, this is in light blue, I pull it back to A, and then this thing factors through that. And now because we're in a right proper model category, this pullback of this weak equivalence is again a weak equivalence. Uh, so that by two out of three, this is an also a weak equivalence. And now if you look at this, uh, bit of the structure here. I'm in the input to the equivalence extension property. Uh, so I, I did my, my blue, that was my factorization here. Now I do my equivalence extension property, that's the red, and I get my y over b by extending x to be equivalent to q. So that gives me my fibration extension property. And then that implies that u is fibrant because uh, uh, at fibrant, if I have a fibrant object, I want to have right, uh, lifting property against an acyclic cofibration. So I have a map from A into it, which is just my fibration X over A. I want to extend that to B. That's just my fibration Y over B that pulls back to X. Again, we have to use this thing to sort of strictify the classifying maps, but that um, ten, uh, ends up working out. <coughs> So that gives us a universe that classifies uh, fibrations with small fibers, which is a fibrant object and which is univalent, satisfies the univalence axiom. Uh, and the last thing we want to know is that it's closed under the uh, operations of type theory, closed under sigma types and pi types and identity types. Uh, so uh, I said before that for sigma types, we're just composing fibrations. So uh, here's a fibration over A and another fibration over C. I com compose them to get a fibration over a uh, single fibration over A, which is going to represent this sigma type. Uh, and in order to be classified by the universe, we need to know that this fibration has small fibers. Uh, and that's basically because kappa is a regular cardinal, um, even if the base, category, base object is a large one. As long as these fibers are small, this one also has small fibers. And then there's a bit of coherence that we have to worry about. So uh, if you think about what's going on to say that the universe is closed under fibrations, we want to interpret this um, formation rule that if I have a type in the universe and a family of types in the universe, then I get another type in the universe. And that has to be sort of a morphism uh, 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 in the type theory. And if I compile out what that means, um, so here's the, ob don't, don't worry about the details of what this categorical notation means. This is the object that represents this context in type theory. So it's uh, an element of the universe, uh, in other words, a small type, and then a type family indexed by that type, a family of small types. And the suppose we want to have a formation rule which maps this context into the universe that, that forms the sigma type. And so what I do is, well, this, this context here has a pair of vibrations over it, which are sort of the universal ones. And so I compose them and that's a small vibration by what I said on the last slide. And so it's classified by some map into the universe. I just pick some classifying map uh, and that gives me my sigma formation rule. This is essentially what Vavatsky did, again, in simplicial sets. Uh, Lumsden and Warren generalized it to these sort of local universes, um, but as long as we, if we're just actually working with universes, we don't even need that version. So that's how we interpret sigma types. Uh, pi types are similar. I already mentioned that uh, we get uh, the pi types from this push forward operation in a right, right proper Sosinski model category. Uh, we needed to preserve smallness of the fibers uh, and that just sort of follows from kappa being inaccessible. It's basically like functions from one small object to one small object form a small set. And then we use the same trick for coherence. We have this sort of universal object. We have two vibrations over it. We take that universal push forward. We classify it by some map into the universe. Um, 
the last basic type former from Martin Left type theory is identity types. Um, and uh, we all know, uh, or we, we've known for a decade or more that these should be classified, these correspond to path objects in a model category. Uh, this was um, Audi, Audi Warren's insight and uh, this is what Vavatsky used as well, uh, way back in simplicial sets. So a path object is a factorization of the diagonal. Um, so in general, we have some vibration over A, we take its pullback with itself, and then there's a diagonal map, and we factor that as an acyclic co-fibration followed by a vibration. And this vibration here is, represents the identity types uh, of, of B, um, dependent on two elements of B. But if we just do this factorization in an arbitrary model category way, using like a small object argument, then um, this guy won't necessarily have small fibers, um, even if uh, this um, even if this original vibration does, because if the base category object is large, then this fiber and replacement incorporates uh, morphisms uh, uh, for paths in the base. But instead, um, we can use this enrichment. So this is the first place we're using this fiber-wise enrichment. We have this fiber-wise co-cylinder, the path object, the exponential with the simplicial interval, and that preserves small fibers, um, essentially because it's stable under pullback. Uh, as I mentioned that this co-cylinder is always stable under pullback. Uh, to check whether it has small fibers, I, I can just pull it back to a representable object, which is a small object. Uh, and so now I'm doing my factorization here all in the world of small objects. And so this is a small object. And so these fibers are the same as the fibers of this guy. So that gives us a way to make sure that the path objects preserve smallness. And then we use the same coherence method. We do this construction in the universal case, and then we classify it by map into the universe. Uh, and then that gives us our identity type formation rule on the universe. Okay. So that, so we have a universe which, which sort of models all the basic formers of type theory, which is fiber and then satisfies the univalence axiom. Questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Is this what it's, large enough means? You're using the fact that kappa is big enough that your model category is kappa combinatorial? Um, so yeah, the, uh, large enough is basically relative. So this, this large enough here uh, is basically relative to the size of the category E, uh, right? So like E is maybe like sheaves on some site. So relative to the size of that site, basically. You, you need that site to be small. Oh, I think, yeah. uh, so you, you, need, you need an inaccessible, which is inaccessible from the definition of E, roughly speaking. Uh, but then E is bigger than kappa, otherwise you wouldn't have the universe. E is bigger than kappa, right. Yeah. So, so you, you, choose, you fix some universe, which is sort of the size of the category of sets, and you use that to define your toposes, but then you need some smaller inaccessible, which is nevertheless right. bigger than the site that defines your topos. Okay, thanks. So Mike, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, sort of following on, really. Um, so I know constructivity is not really an issue here, but, but uh, it'd be cool if you could just there are several sort of blocks, right, to, to having an elementary account of this. And if you could just to, to say what they are. I mean, obviously, in it, having an inaccessible cardinal is, you know, the, the beginning one, but uh, there are other places. Yeah, I don't really think of an inaccessible as the, as a, as the biggest sort of obstacle to, to constructivity, because if you're working constructively, you want to, you, you sort of have an, a, you, by inaccessible, you, you really mean a universe that's sort of closed under all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah, I um, agree. Yeah. So yeah. you just sort of replace it by that. Uh, yeah. the, uh, to, uh, the, there is sort of non-constructivity that comes in in a bunch of places, and I don't want to try to isolate that now. Um, I will say, Possibly the the biggest obstacle that I don't know under, know how to deal with to constructivity, and I was going to say this also at the end is, is this 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 Sasinskiness, because in in the, the 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 approaches the constructive approaches to model categories that um, people have taken so far usually not all the monomorphisms are allowed to be cofibrations, even in like simplicial sets. So yeah. I haven't thought at all about whether there's a way to deal with that, but um, that's one. I mean, we, we, if you're in a particular pre shift up us, then you, you have things that you can say, but 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 uh, it's not clear what to do in general. Yeah, yeah, that's this is, uh, maybe I should have been more explicit about that at the beginning. That that at the moment, for basically for all of this talk, I'm being very classical in my model category theory. Uh, that isn't to say that I don't care about trying to make it constructive later, but at the moment, it's enough to um, to be able to do it classically. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yes. On that. Um, 
well, one of the approaches that the cubicle people use, of course, is just to assume that the co-fibrations are classified rather than that they're all monos. Mm -hmm. You have a co-fibration classifier and you put some axioms on that. Yeah, so I haven't thought about to what extent that's, that sort of approach will, will make exactly this machinery work. Obviously, it works for what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but it would be worth sort of trying to make them make them match. Right. My questions. All right. Um, so, uh, so this next thing that I wanted to tell you about is something on the other side. So I talked about how a type theoretic model topos interprets type theory. And now I want to talk about a little bit about how it models higher categories. Uh, now I'm not going to get into what a higher, what an infinity category is or anything like that. Instead, I'm going to rely on the definition of a, uh, an infinity one topos as being a left exact localization of a pre-sheaf infinity one category. And the fact that each of those pieces can be represented in terms of model categories. So the, the theorem that implies that we can model all infinity one toposes of the Grodin de Glory sense, at least not necessarily the elementary sense, is that we include simplicial sets. We're closed under passing to diagram categories, um, sort of pre-sheaves or internal pre-sheaves on uh, uh, with the values in a type theoretic model topos. And we're also closed under left exact localizations. Um, so passing to sheaves basically in, in addition to, to pre-sheaves. So let me say a little bit about how that works. So first of all, simplicial sets, um, it's really very straightforward to show that the standard Quillen model structure on simplicial sets is a type theoretic model topos. It's right proper, it's Sosinski, it's simplicial, it's Vinich over itself. Um, and in this case, we take every fibration to have a unique fibration structure. So what that means is that uh, in terms of our, our, our universes or our classifying maps, this means that um, Fx, for if there's some map uh, x to y, Fx is actually a subobject of y. It's the subobject of Y consisting of all the simplices over which we have a fibration, basically. And the reason that works is because the generating acyclic cofibrations have representable codomains. So we don't need some extra structure to make this, make this work. And this gives us Vavadsky's original model in con complexes, which are the fibrant objects. So that's, we get the simplicial sets like that. And now we're gonna move on from there. Okay, so, um, the, the most difficult thing, which I'm gonna sort of skip over a lot of the details of uh, for, for reasons of time, is to pass two diagram categories. <clears throat> so uh, intuitively what's going on is we have some type theoretic model topos E, which presents some infinity one category. And then we have a small category. We wanna take functors from C to E. So you can think about it as a small category. In general, it's gonna, it's gonna be enriched, but that's not really important for the idea. Um, and we can build, we can consider the category of strict functors and also the category of weak infinity one functors. So this one is an infinity one category down here. This one up here is a strict one category. And we might hope that this thing up here can model this thing down here. But it's not enough to use what you might call the pointwise homotopy theory um, because uh, we don't get all the right morphisms that way. So it is the case that every weak functor, so the objects of this is equivalent to a strict one, but um, if I have two strict functors, then every, not every weak natural transformation, so something which is natural up to coherent homotopy, not every one of those is equivalent to a strict natural transformation. So what I have to do is restrict the strict functors further by imposing some additional model structure on this so that my fibrant or my cofibrant objects are gonna be the ones where this is true. So um, what we, the one that we use is called the injective model structure. Uh, and the way to think about it that I like to think about it is that we say that an object is injectively fibrant or uh, another word which is used in two category theory is flexible. If whenever I have a weak natural transformation with codomain X, then it is equivalent to a strict natural transformation by a natural operation that leaves the strict transformations fixed. So there's some details about this equivalence here. This is structure rather than a property, uh, but this is basically the idea that we can rectify pseudo natural transformations into X into strict ones. Uh, and then there's a relative version of this for an injective fibration and it gives us an injective model structure. So these are the fibrations in that model structure and it gets all the right proper Sosinski and enrichment properties from our E, this model, model category that we started from. This is not 
the usual definition of an injective model structure. Usually it's defined to be, to have the uh, uh, co-fibrations be the monomorphisms, the pointwise ones, but it turns out to be equivalent to this. And this definition also gives us a way to get to define these vibration structures. So there's a, there's a thing called a weak morphism co-classifier or a co-bar construction, which has the property that strict maps into it are equivalent to weak maps into X. Uh, and then to say that X is injectively fibrant is the same as saying that it's a retract of this classifying object. Uh, and that gives us a way to define this F. Uh, we just sort of define it to be the classifying object of retractions of this sort. So in other words, a, a fibration structure on X is a retraction. Uh, so there's a canonical map from X into the CX, which says every strict map is equivalently, is, is in particular also a weak one. And to give a retraction like that is a fibration structure on X. Mike, before you go on, um, yes. So, before you were using f of x to refer to uh, x sort of mirronymically as the total space of a map. Yeah. Is this x mapping into the terminal object? Uh, um, yeah. So, so in, in this case, if I'm talking about just about a fibrant object, then I am talking about x mapping into one. Uh, but there's also, as I said, there's also a relative cobar construction for a vibration. Uh, so, so uh, if I have I need some more space here. Um, if I have uh, if I have an x over y, uh, then there's a there's a c y x you might call it, um, over, live, which also lives over y. And then to say that x is a is a vibration is to say that this has a retraction, and okay. then I can use that to build my f x, which is the object of retractions living over y. Okay, thanks. Sorry that I was ambiguous about that. Okay. So. Uh, so that gives us a way to define this, this notion of vibration structure. Uh, a, so we can show, I mean, we, can, we can prove that then when the E is a type theoretic model topos, then this injective model structure is also a uh, type theoretic model topos. So that's the, the diagram categories. And then the last piece um, is left exact localizations. So let me say what that means, uh, localization. So there are two different kinds of localizations. And so in some sense, the point of what's going on here is the interaction between those. So on the one hand, there's a classical notion of local object uh, localization in model category theory. If I have a model category and I have a set of maps in this model category, then I say that if I have a fibrant object, I say that it's local or externally local if it thinks all the maps in S are weak equivalences. In other words, if I have a map in S from A to B, then the precomposition on the mapping spaces here uh, is, a, is itself a, a, an equivalence. And this gives us, these are the fibrant objects in a local model structure, uh, which is sort of localized at this set of maps. And then there's also an internal notion of local object in type theory, which we can then interpret into a model of type theory. So we have a set of maps and we have, I'm gonna express this in the relative version. I have a vibration. So I think about this as a, as a type X in context Y. Then I say it's internally local if it's the case in the internal type theory that precomposition uh, is an equivalence. So this is the is equiv in the sense of hot. Uh, I have a map in S. These are sort of the function types. And so I have a map between function types given by precomposition with F. And I'm asserting in type theory that this is an equivalence. So in other words, right, I build this is equiv. It gives me a, 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 another vibration over X. And here I'm saying that this has a section. So there's some term that belongs to this type. And uh, Egbert and Boss and I studied these in a, in, in a paper. They're in the hot book. Other people have used them too. Um, and these form what's called a reflective subuniverse of the universe of, of types. So the, in, in general, these are different notions. But the point is that in the left exact case, um, they coincide. So left exact means that the reflection operation so I didn't say what the localization of reflection is. So it takes an object and it turns it universally into a local one. Um, is left exact means that that operation preserves finite limits or equivalently pullbacks. So if I, if I have a type theoretic model topos and I have a set of maps where localization is left exact in this sense, then uh, a vibration is internally local in that sense, the, the type theoretic sense, precisely when it's a vibration in the local model structure. Um, so the external locality it coincides with the internal locality. 
And uh, I just want to mention, briefly mention that there's, this uses a characterization of left exactness um, due to uh, an albedo and finster and uh, which is uh, um, forthcoming, but I think it's been talked about in various places, so you might have heard of it. Um, now, once we, and once we have this equivalence, then we can use that to define our structure vibrations for our local model structure. And so uh, we just say, uh, right, we want to build a type, right? So I have X over Y or X over gamma, um, which is a vibration. And I want to say, I give a structure on this to be not just uh, a vibration. Um, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm missing something here. Uh, I mean, uh, this should be, so I mean, not just a, I, I want this to be also a vibration uh, in E, but now I've, I'm enhancing that to be a vibration relative to S. So it, it's a vibration in E, uh, but it's also got this property that precomposition is an equivalence. And I can express that internally be, because it's equivalent to internal locality uh, to give me a, a, a vibration uh, in this sense, uh, so a classifying object. So in other words, a vibration structure on this vibration is, uh, to, in the local model structure, is it's a vibration structure in E together with uh, a witness uh, belonging to this, that, that, that this is, this, these part composition maps are an equivalence in the internal sense. <clears throat> so that tells, that allows us to prove that if we have a type theoretic model topos and we left exact localize it, then we get another type theoretic model topos. So if we put all that together, we get this here, that um, we get um, all of the infinity one toposes because we can get all of them by starting with simplicial sets, passing to some category of simplicially valued pre-sheaves, diagram categories, and then localizing that in some way to get a category of sheaves. Maybe, uh, I, I guess I maybe as well stop for questions here. We're almost done, but uh, are there any questions on this? But it's not the end of the talk, what is it? Well, uh, I, had, I had one more slide that was just gonna go briefly over uh, generalization. Why don't we do one more slide? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it may be me enjoying it too much, but yeah. So I just wanted to say a little bit about variations. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the definition that I gave is a simpl simplicial. Well, actually not really. I, I, if I lied, if it was one more, if I said it was one more slide, I shouldn't zoom in. Because uh, that would be three more slides. So uh, I said, uh, the definition that I gave it was a simplicial definition. We had a, a we're simplicially enriched. Um, but uh, you can also sort of generalize that to talk about um, enrichment over other things. Uh, and you can talk about enrichment over cubicle sets um, for some different kinds of cubicle sets. Uh, it works best for, as far as I know, for Cartesian cubicle sets. I don't know a way to make this work yet for um, substructural ones, but there may be one. Uh, basically, if you have enriched over cubicle sets, then you want to take your cylinders to be co-powers with the cubicle interval instead of the simplicial interval. And as long as that's all fiber-wise, then that can work out as well. That sort of fiber-wiseness is what fails in the, the, uh, the substructural uh, cubicle sets. Um, there's also a way to try to do this um, in a way that includes both the simplicial and the cubicle world. Uh, namely, that instead of having some literal enrichment, you just sort of axiomatize the behavior of the cylinder and the co-cylinder that you need. Uh, and then uh, the last thing um, that, I, uh, that I've already mentioned in response to a question is, can you make it constructive? And the biggest problem that I, I, I see for that is dealing with the sasinski -ness. But it's possible, uh, as, as Steve said, that you might be able to do that with the classifiers. OK, um, I should probably stop. OK, well, let's thank Mike. Please don't unmute your mics, but we're doing visual applause. So please join me in thanking Mike for this fantastic talk. Um, and uh, I already can see in the chat that there are some calls for zooming in. Um, so. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe if there are other questions, I'll let's start with those, and then we're gonna do some zooming in. Well, I was gonna ask you to zoom out so we can see about hits. Ah, that's the last, the previous one. Yeah, uh, that's a, there's a lot of zooming in there that I didn't even get into. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, we know um, 
constructing constructing hits. Uh, Peter Lumstein and I wrote a paper about that, and that works in general more generally than type theoretic model topuses, um, using uh, sort of uh, cell monads that are built up by pushouts of monads and so on, uh, and that re relies on the uh, the cylinder objects that are stable under pullback. Uh, so you use those to build uh, homotopy pushouts that are sort of sta weakly stable under pullback. Um, and uh, the tricky bit is, is showing that the universes are closed under pullbacks. And that's sort of a uh, work in progress that's not written down yet. Um, but uh, the, basically the idea is if you, you build this, um, you build a higher inductive type, um, which is not necessarily fibrant, you then you have to fibrantly replace it in some sort of coherent algebraic way. Uh, and the problem is that that fibrant replacement might blow up the size of the fibers. So basically the idea is you're living over the universe um, and you can sort of uh, the, break the universe down into small pieces and do the fibrant replacement piece by piece uh, in order to preserve this, the size of the fibers over each piece so that they get bigger and bigger, but they never actually get bigger than kappa. Uh, so again, the details of that haven't all been written down yet, but I'm pretty confident that it, it's going to work. Did you say any other the universe is closed under pushouts or pullbacks? Maybe I uh, misunderstood. Sorry. Um, well, it's, it's certainly closed under pullbacks, uh, homotopy pullbacks. That, that those are just built out of sigma types and identity types. Um, but what I was just talking about now is is, is also closing it under pushouts, which takes some more work. Can you say some things about W types as well? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean here, uh, let me find it. Uh, a W type is uh, an initial algebra for um, a uh, polynomial uh, uh, endofunctor. So set classically, you sort of build it as a uh, an uh, infinite colimit, you sort of apply your functor uh, again and again and again, and you take some colimit of some sequence. And at each step, um, it, you're sort of doing some push out to sort of add extra F stuff. Uh, and the point uh, to make it homotopical is that you have to do a fibrant replacement uh, sort of built in at every step to make it fibrant. Uh, and sort of this is the thing that you have to worry about blowing up the size, uh, but sort of Doing at least doing this is is already in in a paper with Peter Lumstein on higher inductive types. Okay. Uh, any other questions, yeah. comments? Uh, I have a, a small question about uh, uh, localization that you talked about in the last part um, of your talk. So. Uh, you kind of work with uh, this set S uh, internally. So the question, how do you do that? So basically, you could just, um, yeah, so this by type on the right, it kind of quantifies our set uh, S, which is kind of external. Uh, yeah, so so, so the, the, the point is like the, the, this, um, uh, let's see, let me say it this way. Um, uh, the probably the simplest way to answer that is to say that this, pi here can be interpreted as an external product in the model category rather than as a pi type. Um, but you can also uh, you can also take your 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 family of maps S and just take the co-product of all of them um, that that lives over some indexing object, a co-product of copies of one, and consider that as an internal family of maps. Uh, can you say something about the hits, the other hits? And I mean, in particular, I have two questions here. First of all, I guess that means also hits with two eyes, inductive, inductive ones. And is this step constructive? Uh, well, it depends a little bit on what you mean by constructive. Um, so uh, the way the way Peter and I did the, these other hits is, is we, we described it by a, a cell monad. Um, so uh, the idea is like you, you you take some syntactic schema or you some some of a hit, and then each constructor uh, has an has an inputs which get interpreted as a polynomial functor, and then uh, that's a, this this is what I'm calling f here, uh, and then the um, 
uh, it has some dimension, which you sort of represent by some globe, uh, like a, a, a path or a two cell or a two simplex or a three simplex or whatever. And then it has an attaching map or a boundary. Uh, and so you, that sort of builds this cell complex. Each constructor, you start from some monad, you, you add a cell and get a new monad, you add another constructor cell and you get another monad. And then the, the hit is, is sort of the initial algebra for this eventual monad at the end. And uh, we described, uh, in some examples sort of intuitively how to get from syntax to this thing but we don't we haven't and no one has as far as i know tried to relate this to a general syntactic schema for hits um what we did doesn't include inductive inductive types um i think that something analogous would probably work for inductive inductive types but i don't know if it's written been written down as for whether it's constructive uh in taking push outs of monads and things like that we're using sort of transfinite constructions in classical um, locally presentable category theory. If you have some way of doing that in, con in a constructive theory, then I would expect that you could do something similar to this. Um, but the best, the only real way I know of doing that in a constructive theory is to have some hits in your constructive meta theory. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Uh, uh, quick question. I think some people wanted to know um, what software this is? <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a virtual whiteboard uh, called Limnu. Um, it's, a, it's an infinite zoomable whiteboard that can be shared by various, lots of people logged into it. Um, I've been using it for uh, research with my summer students. But I don't know whether I would recommend it for giving talks. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll do it again. <laughs> Why not? Uh, maybe that's, I'll take that offline. <laughs> I thought the zooming in was brilliant. That maybe. was a nice, that was a nice feature. <laughs> Makes me feel slightly I mean, I think, I think it's, oh, go ahead. Andy, go ahead. Uh, I can say all the zooming in made me feel slightly seasick. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Um, this is a bit off topic, but can induction recursion be understood in any of these models? I don't know. Uh, maybe one, one question, a really quick one. Shouldn't um, the model of type theory that you get in every one of these model toposes be unique? Unique in what sense um it's a good question i don't know uh but uh, i'd say that if you take something like the syntactic category of type theory then you should have uh, uh, some kind of unique map to the simplicial set model topos and that uh, any interpretation should factor uniquely in some sense through this. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a conjecture, I believe, that the syntactic category of type theory presents the infinity initial object of the infinity category of something or others, uh, yeah. in which case that sort of would be unique in this infinity categorical sense. Yeah. Is that the sort of thing you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. Except yeah. that uh, you, you, you'd have to restrict the growth and deep infinity topoi to, I mean, to, to use what you're doing to, uh, so, so you'd have this kind of factorization where the syntactic category factors through the simplicial set model of, you know, the infinity groupoi model. Well, then these interpretations don't go through the simplicial set model. That the simplicial set model is one of these interpretations, mm -hmm. but this is the interpretation doesn't go through that. Right, but you, you should have a functor from infinity groupoids, a lex functor from infinity groupoids to any infinity topos presented by. Well, yes, uh, that's because it's the terminal infinity topos. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Something of that kind. Yeah, yeah, but that functor doesn't preserve all the type theoretic structure. It doesn't preserve mm. pi types in the universe. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Yeah. Here's maybe a related a question. question. Yeah, I have maybe a related question to the last one. If I suppose I start with some infinity topos, but then I present it 
in two different ways as a type theoretic model topos. Maybe there are different ways of interpreting even that statement. But then do I get interpretations of homotopy type theory that validate the same, the you know, same inhabited, stuff like this? And, and what, what does it even mean for them to be the same? Yeah. Because they live in different categories. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, someone should answer it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I in, 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 yeah, and uh, people are working on it, I know. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, intuitively, they should be the same. Uh, modulo choices that you have to make, right? Like you have to choose the inaccessible and sort of you make like, well, how do you relate? How do you say that this universe is the same as that universe and other things like that? But you can hope that they would be the same. Right, I guess if you pick a different inaccessible, you'll get different statements of the form where there exist and many nested inaccessibles, things like that. Yeah. Okay. I have one other question. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. One more question that it goes past even beyond your uh, constructive question, question, question. But um, how much of this might survive in a model category where you don't even assume that every object is cofibrin? Does that seem possible at all? And then you only look at cofibrin objects for maybe equivalence extension property and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the answer to that really either. Okay. Um, if if this talk has inspired people to go out and figure out the answers to those questions, then I will regard it as a success. Great, thank you. All right, anyone else? Okay, I'll wait one more second maybe. We're not really saving the audience now because there are no more talks, so. Okay, uh, let's thank Mike again uh, for this great talk. Um, and folks, that was the conference. Uh, that's it. Thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you when Hotis returns in the fall. <laughs>